Denmark has uh, been able to keep COVID mortality relatively low. Uh, and I'm wondering why that's the case. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we did have some excess mortality, especially do, do, during our uh, second wave. Our second wave was in December and January. Uh, and the excess mortality was especially, of course, in, in the elderly, uh, which I, I believe many countries have experienced the same. But uh, one of the reasons why we have maintained a very low mortality, I think uh, one reason is that we were able quite early in the pandemic to contain um, COVID-19 disease among the elderly, uh, especially also in the old age care homes and also elderly citizens uh, residing in their own uh, houses. Uh, and this uh, we did from, and this was of course before we had the vaccines introduced. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons. And secondly, of course, uh, we have a very, very robust hospital system in Denmark. So even despite the, the two heavy waves that we had, especially the second wave in, in our winter, uh, our hospitals were never uh, overburdened. Of course, it was a very busy and tough second wave, but we were never anywhere close to our intensive care units being uh, overburdened. And, and we also were managed from the first wave to the second wave to improve our treatment very much. Uh, so we can actually look at the numbers and see that we were our hospitals were more capable in uh, keeping um, uh, COVID-19 cases out of intensive care, out of the respirator, and also uh, with increased survival. And then the third, of course, was our vaccine rollout, uh, which we prioritized um, uh, with the uh, elderly and, and the sick uh, and the healthcare personnel. Yeah, I noticed that... Um that uh, Denmark started quite early, but it, it seems to really build a, a stronger momentum in June, July, um, May, June, July, uh, coming into the summer, uh, so that the, the first group to have been immunized um, were probably your most vulnerable. Are you getting to the point now where you're, you're starting to worry that perhaps they may not be so well protected now, um, so many months later? I may need a, a booster. Oh yeah, we, we already decided on, on uh, the booster strategy for the first groups, uh, the, the vulnerable. Uh, so cancer patients on chemotherapy, uh, organ transplanted people, etc. we're already offering them a third shot. Well, that's a very limited group, but we know that they have a very poor response from the first two shots. And now this week we are rolling out a third sh shot, the booster shot, if you if you will, uh, for for old age care homes. Uh, and then we are discussing very intensely uh, how to expand uh, the booster program, but we haven't decided on that yet. Mm. Are you doing some research to look at what the baseline levels of uh, neutralizing antibodies are, and then um, what the response is post the dose, things like that? Yeah. And we are very fortunate to have a very robust uh, scientific study set up already before we started rolling out the vaccine. This is a, a independent researchers based in our university hospitals, but it's a government funded study. Um, the name of the study is in force. Uh, so they basically enrolled uh, people uh, before they were vaccinated. So we actually have blood samples with antibodies as well as cellular immune response. We have those uh, data from people before they got the vaccines. And then we are basically collecting blood samples uh, uh, after they get vac vaccinated. And, and this is all actually used by us to direct our uh, revaccination strategy. And um, are you using a mRNA vaccine to, to, um, to, uh, for the boost for the third dose? And yeah, this is what we are, we are planning to do. Uh, of course, we are still uh, waiting uh, data from uh, regulatory authorities. Um, I believe that both uh, BioNTech Pfizer and Moderna uh, will submit uh, data uh, or have already submitted data on the booster uh, studies uh, to the FDA and, and the EMA, which is the European Regulatory Authority on Medicines. Yeah, I'm actually just in the middle of writing an explainer on, on um, third doses or boosters. 
And uh, I had previously interviewed um, Shane Crotty at La Jolla Institute in uh, California. And he was saying that um, with uh, typically with a third dose, they see that um, in, in uh, that antibody levels return at least to the, the previous peak, if not two to four times higher than the previous peak. Um, and that, that antibody level is, uh, is more durable. It, it wanes more slowly than what we see after uh, the, the prime series. Is that your experience as well? Or, uh, well, is that your advice or what you, you understand? Uh, yeah, this is certainly our uh, expectation, I would say, of, of the data that haven't been published uh, yet. Uh, but this is sort of what we are expecting to see at least uh, non-inferiority, uh, meaning that a boost will bring back antibody levels or neutralize immunity or vaccine efficacy, whatever the estimate you look at. Uh, vaccine efficacy is probably the best term to look at. And it's going to bring it back to at least the level that we saw uh, of the RNA vaccines uh, with the original Wuhan strain, uh, which is basically the, uh, the randomized controlled trials that we got uh, in uh, December of um, 2020 and that were the basis of the uh, approval by, uh, by the European Medicines Authority, but probably even higher. What we're looking at, of course, uh, antibody levels, et cetera, is very interesting, but still just a proxy for what really matters, which is vaccine efficacy. And what really, really matters in our perspective is the level of uh, breakthrough disease. So how many fully vaccinated people actually get sick and require hospitalization? This is what we call breakthrough disease. And we are monitoring this very closely with our data in Denmark. It's a little bit different from, from breakthrough infection, which is what most people are talking about. But we know that these vaccines are not sterilizing, meaning that you can still carry the virus. You can probably still transmit the virus, even despite being fully vaccinated and even despite actually being very well protected against disease. So that's the point of it. Uh, you'll probably carry the virus in your nasal cavity, um, you don't get sick from it. You probably transmit it much less uh, than a non-vaccinated person, but, but it's still not sterilizing. And, and that's probably okay uh, if we have a very, very high coverage with the vaccines and with a booster. Yeah, I, I'm just curious because um, with, with the, the third doses, it seems that uh, there are some two maybe arguments for it. One is um, to protect against severe illness and hospitalization. Another is to try to get antibody levels back up to somewhere close to a sterilizing um, capability, at least for a short time, so that you can slow and stop transmission and, and get to like some sort of herd immunity. Um, it sounds more like uh, the Denmark, the Danish um, strategy is more in the former, uh, protecting against severe illness and hospitalization. Yeah, uh, for, for a number of reasons, of course, it's a little bit speculative. Uh, if, if a boosted dose is going to be sterilizing, uh, probably not. Uh, but as long as it protects against severe disease and hospitalization, I think we are okay as long as we have a very high vaccine coverage, especially among the vulnerable. And this is one of the reasons why we are, uh, as you can see, have very few restrictions in this country, despite having the Delta variant. It's because we have an extremely high level of vaccine coverage among everybody above the age of 50, among all healthcare uh, personnel. It's like 99% vaccine, fully vaccinated among healthcare personnel more than 95% of everybody in, in the country above the age of 50. So despite the vaccines not being sterilizing and, and we don't have full protection against transmission, this uh, enables us to have a very low disease burden. I think even with a booster shot, uh, there's also a technolo technological or biological explanation why it's probably not going to be sterilizing because it's a, the, the vaccine is giving intramuscular uh, it develops uh, antibodies and cellular immune response that protects, you might say, the inner organs, which is the, the reason for the very severe COVID-19 disease, cardiovascular system, intestines, lung, 
the respiratory tract, of course. Uh, but not uh, viruses in the upper respiratory tract. You will probably need uh, a nasal vaccine, which we know is, has been developed for, for use in, in influenza, uh, especially in kids. So a nasal vaccine could probably have a much higher chance of being uh, sterilizing, but that's just speculative. But, but this is not the, the technology we have now. The technology we have now are the RNA vaccines, which are extremely effective and safe. We should really, I mean, this is an amazing scientific breakthrough with the RNA vaccines we have. Do you have any idea on when Denmark might look to offer third doses to the rest of the, you know, the healthy population, the healthy young? Um, I don't, I cannot, uh, regarding timeline, I will not, uh, I don't have the specifics, but we're certainly planning for it. Uh, so procuring the vaccines, uh, looking at the evidence, and I, I expect that we very soon will be able to sort of be, uh, have more details regarding our uh, uh, booster rollout. What we're looking at is, of course, uh, what should be the interval uh, since uh, being fully vaccinated, six months, eight months, 10 months, 12 months, uh, which groups to prior prioritize first. Yeah, and do you, are you seeing it more as though um, that full immunization is going to require um, at least three, three doses spread over like two fairly close together and then a third one later and then perhaps that might be sufficient for, for most people. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, but it's still, we are waiting for the data. I mean, this data is being uh, developed by, of course, vaccine producers, but also independent study. There's a, a study in the UK where they have looked at, at various uh, boosting uh, regimes. Uh, I believe that uh, UK study is also very near uh, maturity. So we will have data published from that. So I think, uh, we should realize uh, regarding this vaccine rollout for, for COVID-19 uh, that we have seen, seen vaccines de being developed and produced and signs being produced at a rapid rate that we wouldn't have imagined. And, and then we are, we're also skipping a little bit ahead of science from time to time because we need to. But, but we should also uh, wait for the science and study it critically. Yeah, absolutely. Um... What do you think are the main things that other countries can learn from the Danish experience? Mm, I mean, one, one thing that has certainly kept us very well through this um, pandemic uh, has been the very high trust uh, in us healthcare authorities. Uh, and we uh, looked at this uh, from a very analytical approach. So we were as a government agency in very close collaboration with behavioral researchers, leading behavioral researchers in our country, almost from day one in the pandemic. And we had that analysis also from previous experiences. So pre-COVID-19, uh, pre uh, we had worked a lot with what are the drivers uh, for this very high confidence. And we had uh, from, from day zero, a very, very high confidence in healthcare authorities in this country. And we managed to even improve that confidence. So that, that is one of the drivers of the very high vaccine acceptance uh, in this country. And it's also the, one of the drivers of the very high uh, acceptance in the population of the recommendations. When we introduced face masks, we had a very high compliance, uh, not a lot of protest. When we took away the face mask again, we had the same very high compliance, whereas you can see in other societies that when face masks were introduced, it was very polarizing, even became political. As you saw in the US, uh, Republicans refused to wear face masks, Democrats did, and they even used it as a political statement. We saw very, very little of that. And what has also been, been seen in other countries and societies that when you repeal the face mask uh, mandates again, people are still continuing to sort of use face masks as a, as a polarizing determinant. We saw none of that. So, so I think that's, um, and I, I, I've been discussing this with colleagues uh, in, in healthcare authorities around the world, also inside the World Health Organization, trying to share our experiences. And it's not easy. It's not easy to build that high confidence uh, in, in your society, uh, but it's not impossible. 
Yeah, I was actually just thinking you gave some very sort of pragmatic advice. I was thinking back to your discussion about even casual sex in um, April 2020. You said mm. sex is good, sex is uh, healthy. We're, we are sexual beings. Um, you, you treated your fellow Danish citizens like adults and not uh like a mm. you know a, a school mom a, a head a principal of a school yeah. like uh, and that, that was such that was so interesting because it was it was just a simple question in one of the numerous press conferences uh, that i was conducting i was standing next to my minister of health then i got this question uh, so can singles have uh, sex during the pandemic it was a very easy question for me to reply to. And, and my reply was, of course, they can. We are sexual beings. Uh, sex is healthy. Sex is good. The Danish health authority is in favor of sex. And that went viral around the world. And what was amazing uh, was that, that many of my colleagues in other countries hadn't walked into that uh, field. And, and even before I got the question on the press conference, we had for a long time on our website, in our FAQ, we had a lot of uh, good replies to people on how to have safe sex in the area of COVID-19. So that had been on our website already for, long, for a long time. Then after I got the question on the press conference and, and everything went viral, I, I tried to check on other healthcare authorities in other countries. And I was amazed to see that virtually none of them had any advice on safe sex in the COVID-19 pandemic, which, which of course amazes me because sex is a human health issue. It should be for all health authorities. Of course, we should advise on how to care for your kids, how to care for sick people, how to have sex. So, so that, that was it. That was basically a very easy uh, question to reply to. But I, I wonder if that just shows um, more authenticity um, and pragmatism um, you know, that, that people respond to. Sure. Uh, and and of, of course, it's also a little bit uh, the way in Denmark, we are a fairly informal society, uh, even, with, uh, uh, even with official, top government officials, uh, uh, we are fairly informal. That's not to say that, that there's not also a very, very high respect of medical authorities in our country. So, so it's not informality uh, as in everything being equal. That's all actually a very high respect for the medical profession uh, in, in our society. And then that's also another of the very strong drivers of the high vaccine acceptance in Denmark is a very high uh, confidence in science uh, uh, that was also pre-COVID-19. So Denmark obviously picked up on the signals around AstraZeneca and the, the risk of, of clot and made... Um, a decision much sooner than other countries um, not to go ahead with that particular vaccine. What do you think the response was in terms of confidence in the vaccination process and making that decision? It, it maintained a very high confidence. That was one of the most difficult decisions I was part of during this whole pandemic. Uh, we were the first country in the world uh, to put the AstraZeneca vaccine on hold uh, in our vaccine rollout. In, in, the middle, in the middle of a raging pandemic and in a situation where we are lacking vaccines, we didn't have vaccine, uh, enough vaccines that we needed. So it was a very, very difficult decision. I had a lot of uh, criticism and opposition uh, also from, from political and, and professional uh, sides in Denmark. And then, of course, we uh, very rapidly uh, uh, developed the science that demonstrated the causality of the AstraZeneca vaccine with the VIT syndrome. This was a, a very uh, beautiful collaboration between us and leading scientists in Denmark and also in other countries. We had a very close collaboration with our colleagues in Norway, Germany, the UK. Um, and it was amazing. In a very, very short time, within a month, we had done research and studies that usually takes maybe half a year or a year. And that allowed us to make the final decision to continue without AstraZeneca and also to continue without the, uh, the Janssen vaccine. That was very controversial at the time. What we did, 
in our communication is what I call radical transparency. Uh, so we communicated very openly, very transparently, and also very detailed to the population. Websites, uh, memos, publications, press conferences, explaining exactly why we did what we did. And that enabled us to maintain a very high confidence in our vaccine rollout. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Katya actually suggested I ask you a question. Um, what makes you a good um, communicator? She said that you have a funny story to tell. So um, that's a leading question. What's your funny story about why you're such a, uh, a leading light in, uh, in Denmark? I, I have no idea what the funny story is, but uh, uh, basically I've been communicating, uh, communicating since I was a, a very young uh, man. Uh, I wasn't originally very extrovert. I was actually a, a shy little boy a very bookish, um, but I was engaged in uh, student council work and, and later in the 80s, uh, also being politically active and, and later in the 90s and the zeros, I had 20 years of being a very active uh, clinician and an academic. So basically I've been communicating in many different domains uh, of society for 40 years. Um, so, so it's Practice makes perfect. Nothing magic to that. It's not an inborn uh, ability. I was shy. Uh, I have, of course, been taught uh, by media people on how to uh, appear in front of a camera. Uh, but that, that's also not the explanation. So basically, practice make, makes perfect. Or uh, almost perfect. I, I wouldn't say I'm perfect, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Experience. I know what you mean. Uh, I think when I looked you up, uh, your... Um, Specialty is um, obstetrics and gynecology, is that right? Yeah, and that's why I visited Melbourne a couple, many years ago, 15 years ago. I was, I was down there for three months and, and doing uh, some surgical uh, uh, expert training with, with colleagues in Melbourne, uh, okay. laparoscopy, et cetera. So, so I was actually, for 20 years, almost 20 years, I worked as an, an obstetrician and gynecologist. Were you doing like IVF work? Uh, no. I, I, I actually never did uh, IVF work. Okay. All the colleagues did that. Yeah, Melbourne's quite um, has had a lot of um, made a lot of contribution to IVF research. I um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, no I was more in the field of uh, benign gynecology uh, and, okay. and surgical treatments of uh, pr prolapsed uh, uterus, etc. Right. Because I was going to ask you when you stopped delivering babies and went moved into public health, but maybe you were never really exactly ten years exactly ten years ago. Oh. Uh, exactly ten years ago, it was this September first of two thousand and eleven. I started working for the government. And the day before, I, I I had the last delivery, the last cesarean section. Okay, uh, were you ever expecting to uh, be confronting a pandemic? Uh, in your capacity. no, never, <laughs> never, ever. I, I never ex imagined that I would uh, have been doing what I have done now for the last eighteen months. It's been in the wildest time of my whole life. I can easily say that without exaggerating. I was just really intrigued that you got behavioral specialists in early. I think that that is um, quite remarkable. I mean, it makes total sense now, but uh, I don't really know that. It, I've not heard of other people doing that. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the types of special skills that have brought to the conversation? Uh, yeah, and I do believe that other countries have done the same, but, but we did it very proactively and very early on, and even including these experts in our advisory boards and, and also collaborating on uh, getting the uh, behavioral data also on a weekly basis. Um, on, on, on many different aspects of confidence in vaccines, on confidence in our behavioral advice to the population, uh, fear, uh, hope, uh, all these domains. And it was extremely useful for us to have that data. We also have comparative data across different uh, countries and jurisdictions, so we can compare. We also got the data segmented into different uh, parts of the population, male, female, old, young, minority background, et cetera. So it, it enabled us to direct 
our communication and our initiatives uh, in a very focused way. And we managed during the COVID-19, we managed to penetrate, maybe it's a wrong word, uh, we managed to reach every part as in every single part of the Danish population with our communication. We never ever achieved that. Usually in health communication, uh, public health communication, uh, you reach uh, mainly educated women <laughs> and, and you never reach the young people or the uneducated males, etc. Uh, with healthcare communication, but we enabled, we, we managed to do that uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so I'm, I'm extremely proud of that. And, and it also, uh, I mean, you asked prior, you asked about the uh, putting the AstraZeneca on hold, what did it do for our vaccine confidence? In that situation, we worked very closely with behavioral scientists, uh, also in advising us how to do our communication, what I call radical transparency, which was in our, in our DNA already before COVID-19 in the way we communicate, but which we really developed during that. And, and that would be one piece of advice to other healthcare authorities, because I've seen colleagues in other countries that uh, uh, didn't commu communicate as transparently as as we try to do. Yeah, I think it, I think it's really interesting what you mentioned about how you're able to reach all kind of strata of, of society because we've seen, you know, in my country, certainly in, in the US and other places, um, just how, how COVID has been so effective at exploiting disparities in society. Mm, and so, yeah. um, you know, we see people who are from migrant backgrounds, for example, um, they have typically um, been the, the most at risk of infection in, in this country um, because yeah. we haven't communicated with them effectively. We haven't been able to tap their social networks and to really understand what cultural drivers might be present um, uh, that, uh, that need to be worked with. Yeah. But, but it's, it's everywhere in all society that the COVID-19 pandemic has been, you might say, a prism or a magnifying glass of the strengths and weaknesses of a society. So if you have a lot of inequality in health, uh, if you have a lot of political division in your society, that's exaggerated. Uh, certainly what has been seen in the US, uh, to, to have one example, whereas if you have a, a strong society with a very strong healthcare system, uh, equal access, uh, taxpayer funded, free of charge, as you have in Denmark, we were much more able to resist that. But we also have our inequalities. We are also struggling uh, with uh, epidemic outbreaks in uh, areas, especially in our big cities, where we have a lot of uh, people with minority background. And we are also struggling with vaccine um, acceptance in, in, this, in these same uh, parts of society. We worked... Uh, very closely and are working very closely with uh, community leaders. Uh, just the other Friday, uh, I visited uh, three different mosques in uh, Copenhagen, including uh, the largest uh, mosques in, uh, in the country, uh, attended the Friday prayer uh, and, and got immediately after the Friday prayer in the largest mosque in Denmark, the, the imam, uh, the prayer leader gave me the microphone and I had the opportunity to, to address the uh, 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 the people attending a Friday prayer. That never happened in our country before that a government official uh, uh, were invited to the non-Muslim government official while attending the Friday prayer. So uh, we, are, we are basically doing everything we can. Now, now we're also doing a vaccine uh, pop-ups in, in retail, large retail stores. Uh, we are visiting with vaccines every single uh, institution of education in this country where, where young people attend. So to trying to, to really get out there. Mm. Do, you, do you think that um, going into, um, uh, into the autumn, into fall, and, and then into winter, are you concerned about another like winter epidemic? Or do you think that the vaccines um, and your booster strategy will really avoid that? No, I'm certainly concerned. We know that this disease has a very strong seasonal var uh, variation, uh, as we know from other um, respiratory tract infections, especially influenza. 
uh, and in, in the northern part of Europe, where we have cold winters and we stay inside in, in poorly ventilated rooms, we certainly always see uh, winter epidemics of influenza and other uh, respiratory tract infections. And we are certainly also expecting to see a surge of COVID-19 uh, in, the, in the coming uh, fall and winter months, uh, because we have the Delta variant being dominant and even despite our very high vaccine uh, coverage. Uh, but uh, and, and now we are keeping society open. We are also doing everything we can to keep schools open. Uh, of course, in schools, we still have an unvaccinated uh, part of the population. So we have now offered vaccines to almost 90% of our population. Uh, the 10% are, of course, kids below the age of 12. Of the 90% of the population that we have offered vaccines, we are expecting to reach a, a take, uh, uptake of 90%. So that's more than 80%, uh, you might say, uh, immunity in the population. Um, that's good, but that's not enough. Uh, so for that reason, I'm expecting a surge this winter. But I'm also looking very much into other uh, diseases, especially influenza. We had almost no influenza last winter because of the restrictions. So what, what is the inherent immunity in the population? How, how high uh, vaccine coverage will we get with influenza vaccines? So we'll, we might have a dual or triple epidemic this winter, COVID-19, influenza, and then other uh, infectious diseases, pneumococcus, uh, uh, RS virus in the kids, et cetera. So I'm expecting my hospitals, our hospitals to be fairly busy this winter. And I understand that you have some industrial issues, nurses threatening to strike. Um, is... Yeah, we, we, we just came out of the, uh, the longest uh, strike uh, labor conflict uh, in, in our history, in healthcare, a, a 10 week long uh, strike of nurses. Uh, that strike was now uh, stopped uh, by parliament, uh, but there are still local strikes ongoing. Um, we still have a large backlog of especially elective surgery patients from the, from the COVID-19 lockdowns, now from the nursing strike, and then going into a winter, which will be very busy, and with uh, a lot of nurses uh, still being very um, uh, disillusioned about the, how their strike was resolved. So that's certainly a, a concern of ours. Yeah. Um, one thing that I did note as well, um, I think your prime minister, I think she mentioned that this, this pandemic... Uh, was not going to be over quickly and that Denmark needed a sort of a longer term strategy, which is why it was investing in, um, uh, was it Bavarian Nordic, the uh, vaccine maker? Um, yeah, this is a, this is a, local, uh, a local vaccine producer that uh, the government has uh, supported, uh, vaccines yeah. being developed, yeah. Yeah, and clearly that's so, part uh, of a... And, and, yeah, Jason, I have to ask, uh, this is going on a little bit longer than I had oh, expected. Sorry, so I can, we can stop here now. We wrap it up because I have an, another meeting that's uh, pushing yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything you uh, haven't talked about you want to mention before I let you go? No, I think we covered uh, all the well, interesting aspects. Uh, you might have asked me a lot of uh, other uh, questions, um, uh, such as tourism and, and, uh, and et cetera, but I don't think we have the time.